Amen. Thanks, Nabil. Um, we do. Uh, we start the Schaefer conferences here with uh, with heavy hearts, I think, because of what's going on in Las Vegas and around the world. Um, Stephen's going to pick that up in a little bit, but um, uh, we do need uh, the blood and the grace and the mercy of our Savior. Uh, in the 1960s and 70s, uh, Covenant College hosted Labrie conferences on campus and welcomed Francis Schaefer as a chapel speaker. Um, now, some half century later, we continue to honor and explore the influence of Dr. Schaefer and his thoughtful engagement uh, of the world as followers of Jesus in our annual Schaefer Conference on True Spirituality. So today, uh, tomorrow, and Wednesday in chapel, we'll have Dr. Uh, Stephen and Belinda Bowman. Uh, we will also have an afternoon lecture today at 4.30 in Sanderson 215 um, on the mark of a Christian. Uh, what it means to live as Christians in this context uh, of pain and suffering. Um, you will receive chapel credit if you go to that lecture. Uh, and then we will close out our Schaefer Conference on Wednesday night with a Josh Gerrels concert here. Uh, doors will be opening at 7.15, so you can start to queue um, whenever you would like to. Uh, now, it is really my pleasure and privilege to introduce our speakers for the next three days, uh, Stephen and Belinda Bowman. Uh, Belinda lived internationally for a decade in conflict and post-conflict zones in the world, working with women who survive in literally the most dangerous places in the world. She's a wife and a mother and a speaker and a contributor to Newsweek's The Daily Beast, to The Huffington Post, to The Washington Institute, to Red Tent Living, and today's Christian Woman. She is the founder of One Million Thumbprints, which you'll hear more about from them, and is working on her first book, uh, she graduated and is a graduate of Covenant's uh, Master's of Education program. And you know when somebody just kind of offhandedly mentions when they were climbing Mount Kilimanjaro that you're in for something interesting. Uh, Stephen transitioned from a career in Fortune 100 sector to Africa, where he directed relief and development programs for nearly a decade before serving as president and CEO of World Relief. Uh, today, he is the executive director of a philanthropic foundation serving the least resourced and least accessible places of the world. He's authored several books, has several degrees, but told me this morning that his wife is his most important mentor and his most influential teachers are his African friends. Stephen and Belinda and their two sons, Joseph, Joshua and Caleb, live near Grand Rapids, Michigan, where they enjoy the woods, the arts, and late night conversations with friends. Will you please give them a warm Scots welcome, Stephen and Belinda. Bowman. Um, just a couple things about us since we're going to be with you for four days so you can ask us these questions. Some things that will intrigue you that you didn't share. My mother was a Catholic nun. <laughs> Belinda's grandfather was a Jewish refugee. During the Holocaust. We were born eight hours apart, same hospital, same year. Dusty. I'll let you guess who's older. More gray hair. It's a hint. Uh, we started dating when we were 15, and we broke up bitterly after a fender bender, and we still have two stories of that incident. We disagree. We still. That one will be long and fiery, so. If you, we yeah. came back together after a motorcycle accident. Got married, honest, this is all true. Got married and went off to Africa. She promised, she twisted my arm, promised me we would go to Africa for six months. I didn't want to go. I followed her. We stayed for six years. And the rest is history. We love each other in spats, even in fun times like this. <laughs> so we're going to co-speak. Come close. We're going to do this together. So tell us if this works. We've got some of our peeps out there. They're going to be honest with us and say, you know what, guys? We really love your smiles, but it didn't work. Okay, it's okay. We can receive that feedback. We can change course. But if it works, then we'll do it again for the next three days. True spirituality. 
Frank Francis Schaeffer talked about this. Halfway through his life, he changed course. He had written some books, and he said, wait a minute, we're missing something. He actually put this forward. He said, Christian, the word Christian has lost its meaning and its luster. We need to redefine it. I would propose to you that question as just as important today as it was then, maybe even more so. What does it mean to be a Christian? What is true spirituality? What does it mean to be evangelical today in the face of so many things? I actually go back to this picture, this little boy here, Syrian kid. He's raising his hands because whenever he sees somebody new that he doesn't know, he throws up his arms because he's so used to checkpoints with guns pointing at him. What does true spirituality mean for this kid? What does it mean for a Muslim mother and her child? What does it mean in the wake of violence, this mom and her son experiencing the violence in Syria? We could talk about violence today with Las Vegas, right? What, is, what does true spirituality mean in the face of violence today? What about in the face of racism? What does it mean to follow Jesus in the space of racism, white supremacy? True spirituality. We're going to do three words over three days. Three ancient words, three biblical words. First one is this. It's a word from the Hebrew text called Hineni. And it's one of the most important words to us, and especially to Belinda. She believes so much in this word, she had it tattooed on her arm. Oh my gosh, they moaned. <laughs> Trust me. Trust me. Yeah. Ooh, yay. <laughs> First thing I had to check to make sure that we were all kosher with tattoos. But, and I hear that there's a debate. But for me, trust me, body art was nowhere in the game plan at 50 years old. Okay, really, it wasn't. But... I went on pilgrimage to Israel this spring to kind of recover some of my Jewish roots. And uh, with a grandfather who fled Israel during the Holocaust, who had a brother and a sister who spent time in Dachau and Birkenau, it was important for me to go back and remember. And as we did, um, I confronted a bit of what was in me and not just what was outside of me. And if you're going to get a tat, there better be a good story. So here, um, if you look at this picture, this is Razuk. This is Razuk's tattoo parlor. And tell me this, look at what the established by date is. Can you see, anybody see it? Shout it out, what is it? Okay, this is on CNN, on National Geographic. I didn't even know this. This is the oldest tattoo parlor in the world. I got myself a story. Now, I have teenage sons in high school, a senior and a junior, and I officially am one of the coolest moms on the block, okay? <laughs> but I'd been thinking about this for a while. This wasn't a... I was going to say, this wasn't a drunken whim. <laughs> well, no, it wasn't. It was something that I had been thinking about for many years. And it was because of this word, Hanani. Um, sorry, I lost my spot here. I'm thinking about my story. I got caught up in being a cool mom. Um, when I walked into the shop, is this picture? Okay. When I walked into the shop, I, I was seated very graciously with a cup of mint tea between Razuk, the current owner, and his dad. And if you look closely at this picture, you can see Razuk's dad photobombing the picture right there. Razuk's dad is 80. They have been as a family in this space for 700 years, and every owner has been a Razuk. And as I sat there, they asked me the natural question. They said, what can we do for you? And I said, I would like a, a simple word on my right forearm, the word Hanani. 
And Brzezuk Sr. looked at me and he said, ah, such an important word. And I felt the weight of his words. A man who's been doing tattoos almost all his life, they're trained. Brzezuk's son is now training and he's nine years old to take the shop. So when he said, ah, such an important word, I knew I had a friend. I knew he understood what I was saying. It, he finished this sentence. He said, such an important word. It is the word of Moses when he took off his shoes. And I don't know, when you're kind of a Jew in Israel, you become very Jew. <laughs> so I, I took up the refrain, as so many young Jewish children will, when a parent starts a story, you get to finish parts of it. So I said, and it's the prayer, the whispered words of Samuel in his bed at night. It's, it's Abraham. It's the word of Abraham as he drew the knife. It's the word of Isaiah when his God says, thunders from the, from the heights, who should I send? It's that word. It's the word of Moses. It's the word of Abraham. It's the word of Samuel and Isaiah. It was a weighty word. He, Razuk smiled at me because he knew we understood each other. It's three simple words in English. It means, here am I. But not just that. It's here am I. In my mind, I'm here. In my heart, I'm present. In my body, I occupy this space in this moment. 100% radically available to you. When we say Haneni to God, it means we hold nothing back. All we have, all we are, is his. You know the story in Isaiah 6. Well, it's a pretty dramatic story, right? It's smoke, and there's these creatures that have six wings, and it's the throne of God, and there's Isaiah, and he's trembling, and there's coals and hot coals on his lips. I always thought the BBC would have a ball with that. They'd do a great job. <laughs> and God says, like Belinda said, who should we send? Isaiah says in response, and he wouldn't have just whispered it. He would have said, thrown up in his arms maybe and said, Hanani, 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 send me, pick me, send me. This idea of being radically available to God. Now, we work really hard um, finding balance in life with God. And for most things that makes great sense balance with your time and your uh your affections where are they meant to be and and everything is about balance in life and you'll get that more and more even in college as you get older but there is an area where we can be extravagant and it's here it's hanani hanani is unbridled unabandoned reckless sort of god i'm your i'm your i'm your woman i'm your man I'm the one recklessly available for you. So this question that Belinda has been grappling with for years, will, you be ex will I be extravagant for God radically available? Yet as beautiful and as uh, intense, can you feel the weight of this word? As intense, anything that Moses, Abraham, Samuel, and Isaiah said has meaning. As intense as this word is, this Hanani was not my Hanani. This wasn't the word that I wanted to put on my body. My Hanani was at another level altogether. As I sat between Razuk and, and his dad, um, and they prepared my arm for the tattoo. Can I just ask, how many of you have? Is that okay? And if you don't wanna fess up, you don't have to. Oh, 
that's so encouraging. You know, solidarity, that's awesome. I was just dying to do that. That's awesome. <laughs> I have one too. <laughs> could do this here, I wouldn't do it anywhere else. I'm sorry. <laughs> um, Razuk asked uh, a question of me as, as he was prepping my arm. Um, and we were talking about Hanani. And I had my arm out. I mean, and he strapped me down because this was my first. And it's really little. It took him all but five minutes, but it hurt like the dickens. And as I had it out, he looked at me really thoughtfully, and he said, who is this word for? And he must have seen my eyebrow go up because I was like, that's an odd question. It's kind of personal, right? And, and he said, it matters. Is this word for you to read? Or is this word for others to read? You can understand why, right? And for him, he spoke e Hebrew, so I know this says Hanani. <laughs> and sometimes it's the smallest, most mundane question that can change everything. At that moment, I remembered that this Hanani the Hanani that I was seeking was not the Hanani uttered by Moses or by Samuel or by Abraham or even the obedient Hanani of Isaiah in chapter 6 that Stephen referenced. As important and as weighty as that word is, I had given my Hanani, Stephen had given his Hanani to God years before. We had been Hanani with God in our walk. This Hanani that I wanted, the one on my arm, was at a whole other level. This was not my promise to God. What I was seeking on pilgrimage was God's promise to me. This text from Isaiah 58, you might know it, be familiar with it. The Israelites were in a really tough place. And they were asking a question, God, why we're fasting and you don't see us? And the fasting in that text, Isaiah 58, is sort of code word for, for worship. We're coming out to church service. We're coming out to the temple. We're worshiping you, God, and you don't seem to hear us. We're, we're humbling ourselves, and you don't seem to notice. Now, you can take a couple takes, depending on who you read, and commentators and so on. One take is, well, they just missed the point of worship, and they were kind of coarse and hard. Or you can take a different perspective, which is, you know what, they were in exile. They were suffering. This is 52 chapters later than Isaiah's experience in Isaiah chapter 6. And they were beaten down, and they were desperate. And there's a little clue, because in, in verse 9, when it says, when you cry for help, that word cry means the kind of tear streaming down your face, heart-pounding, voice-faltering kind of cry. So there wasn't necessarily... Uh, an apathy. There was a sense of sincere pursuit of God. And the answer was, well, where are you, God? You know, we're making ourselves available to you, but we don't see you. And I don't know if you ask that question today in our culture, or maybe you ask that question personally. Maybe you're being met with the silence of God in your life, which is, okay, um, I've been pursuing you, God, sincerely pursuing you. Now, you may be in another place, and I've been there in my, my times in my life, too. We both have together separately where you're actually faking it, and it's like, you know what, I'm doing the motions, but I know, you know, I know deep in my heart when it's fake. And that's, that, this, all this still applies. But I think the context here is a genuine, sincere pursuit, and God is dead silent. And you know what it's like. When God is silent, it's really hard not to think God doesn't care, especially if you're going through tough times. 
And so they're crying out to God, where are you? And God says, um, wait a minute, is this the fast that I actually, is this the kind of worship I was asking for just for a day? Is this the kind of praise and worship songs and prayers that I was looking for? Or is it something else? And then he asks a bunch of questions, gives a, a sort of a if-then statement. Is this not the kind of fasting? Break the chains of injustice, untie the cords of the yoke, set the oppressed free, break every yoke. Is it not to share your food with the hungry, to spend yourselves on their behalf, he says later. Is it not to turn away from your own flesh and blood? Wait a minute, God, how can you ask us to serve others when we're so desperate ourselves? Things are falling apart here. We don't even have a temple. We're in exile, and you're saying go and serve the least of these? And God is saying, yeah, in your own need, it's counterintuitive for you and for me. When you're struggling, it's absolutely against your emotions, everything that's coming at you, to step outside yourself and say, I don't have this all figured out yet in myself or my family or my friends, but somehow I'm going to step outside and I'm going to just sort of just make myself available to God. If you do that, if you fast in that way, now he's saying something about worship as well. Worship cannot just be vertical. It can't just be personal righteousness before God. It has to be that, but it has to be horizontal too. It has to be corporate. It has to be about others, not just God. So it's both. You can think of it as a cross, vertical, horizontal, justification for our sins, justice for people around us. If you do that, look at this. It's amazing. Then your light will break forth like the dawn. You're looking for healing? Here it is. It will appear. You're looking for righteousness? You're looking to be rise and shine like the church of Jesus Christ in a land that is faltering in big ways? Your rear guard before you, behind you, the glory of God will descend upon you. Whoa! Then you will call. God will answer. You will cry. This is the tears streaming down. This is the shaking right? This is like, man, I don't know who I am. This stinks. This sucks. I'm suffering. My family, my friends, my hope, my calling is gone. When you call, when you cry, then God, you know what God says? It's the only place in scripture. All these other places, Abraham, Samuel, Isaiah, Hanani, Hanani, if I'm following you, you're doing this in your lives. Now you've done this. God, I'm your person. I'm your woman. I'm your man. The only place, just hear the silence, hear the gravity. When you do this and you serve the least of these, your light will shine, your healing will come, your righteousness will dawn, and I will say to you, Hanani, God says to you, to me, Hanani, I will be radically available to you. All I have is yours. That's the Hanani on this wonderful woman's wrist. It's counterintuitive, being extravagant for God, serving the least of these in a land where the least of these are often still considered optional. All I have is yours, God. God says back, all I have is yours in return. Is this not true spirituality. What does it mean to be a Christian today? I don't know. That word is being lost. What does it mean to be evangelical? I can tell you what it means. Word starts. God, I'm available for you. Radically available. And when we serve the least of these especially, when we serve others in our own need, God is radically available for us. He says Hineni back to us. That's why Belinda can read it on her arm. So Belinda didn't know I was going to say this, but she is living this text because she just set out and started to, in the last five years, she launched an organization, I think out of here, Covenant, right? It was birthed here. I have some really good peeps in here that help me out here, so. The goal of this organization, we'll talk more about it tomorrow in chapel, is to serve women who are traumatized by violence and war. So the worst of the worst, the least of these, people who are suffering. And Belinda, in her own, moment of Hanani is going through some stuff from her childhood that she's not worked out yet. 
Now, I don't know if you're there or if you've been there or if you just put it aside and it's okay. Sometimes you put it aside for 20 years. That's what we've had to do. She's trying to work out some of her own stuff from her childhood. And she's praying these texts and these scriptures. And God says, well, you know what? We'll work that out. But in the meantime, go out and serve others who are suffering. Go out and serve women who are traumatized by war. As she cries Hanani to God, I'm available for them. God has now led her to a program where she's getting a certificate in trauma care. And in that space, God is helping you sort through your own story, which is awesome. Hanani, that's the first word. There's going to be two more, right? Tomorrow and the next day, two other words, three words total that I think we believe, we've been praying through, that take Christianity from something that's ill-defined today. We're losing the heart of it. Schaefer called it out. We're calling it out with him. What does it mean to follow Jesus? First word, Hanani, radical availability. You can be extravagant in this. There's, you, you don't ever have to stop. And as you do serve the least of these, God says, I'll be extravagant for you. Let's close in prayer. Father God, as I turn my palms up to you and remember that I am not forgotten or forsaken, that as you lead me, as you lead my husband, as you lead my children, as you lead my brothers and sisters in this room here and now, as we move as your people in exile, we turn our hands up to you and we say, Lord, Hanene, 100% of us is yours. Take what we give. And we believe in our depths and we trust with our guts that you see us as people and you say back to us, you say, I am yours, all that I am, all that I have is at your reserve. Hanene, my child. And Father, I bear witness today in your name, Jesus, as my savior, as the rescuer of my soul, as the one who knew me as a child and knows me as a woman, that I love you, Lord, that we love you, Lord, and we accept your gift to us. Father, in the face of violence today around the world in Las Vegas, um, in the face of so much need, the least of these in the Caribbean, Puerto Rico, in the face of uh, trauma in Syria, we say, Hanani, we are available to you. Make yourself available to our brothers, our sisters, our friends, people who don't know you yet. Make yourself available. And Father, when you say back to us, and <laughs> when you say to us, follow me, God, we um, will follow you there to those places. We'll follow the pathway of Isaiah 58. Then the light will dawn, the healing will come, the righteous will be before and after us. In your name, Father, we pray all these things, Father, from the heart of Hanani. Amen. Praise God from who